You got the theme song there, Angela, or is it? Oh, yes. And Cliff is even prepared to provide percussion. All right. right. Everybody ready for this? <laughs> Life is sweet and sour. Baba, the perfect flower. Says now don't be tower. Come to the arty hour. Which just gets wild. He has the power to make love shower and turn the back glower into happy hour. Which just gets wild. Oops. He has. <laughs> All kinds of troubles just melt into rubble thus All our differences vanish into nothingness Baba's sweet caress Worry vanishes A great game of chess For him who loves you best Life just gets His wine wild. All kinds of troubles just melt into rubble. Thus, all our differences vanish into nothingness. Life is sweet and sour. Baba, the perfect flower, says, Now don't be tower. Come to the arty hour, which just gets wild. Just gets wild. That was great, Angela. I love that song. Yay. Thanks. Hey, Baba. <laughs> yeah, a group of them just made it up. Just it's getting wower, man. Jay yeah. Baba. Yeah, the key word is wower, in case you don't know that vocabulary word. It's a it's a Yale vocabulary word. <laughs> That's so cute. <laughs> Hugh Flick, yes, you agree. <laughs> Anybody have anything? Oh, Ruthie, you did great today. That was. Oh, really that was a great program today. Wow. Wow. That was indeed. That was, wow. that was really great. How long did that go for? It went for. It went right like up until a half hours or so. Oh, three hours. I love the video you made. Did you make that video? Yeah, mm -hmm. but I, you know, when I tried to show it at the end, it just got. I know, but it froze. How did you make it in iMovie or something like that? Yeah, a strong suggested from an old friend. Jane. Use iMovie, she said. Oh, <laughs> All of your videos have been wonderful. Absolutely. There was yeah. there wasn't a dry eye in the house. Oh, thank you. Well. I, had to get I was looking. And it was just so emotional. It was beautiful. So sweet. That's such a beautiful song. Oh, uh, he sang yes. that at her funeral, and boy, everybody was weeping downtown. You know. Which he, song do you mean? Surrender. Surrender. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Damien, can you think of a a Darwin story from your times? Oh gosh. Um, yeah, so many, so many, you know, um, but um, I don't know, just, I mean, Darwin had a great sense of humor as well as being such a loving guy. Um, but he, you know, he would also like, we'd used to, near the end, we were taking care of him and he'd take a uh, walk every day. He walked right up to the last days of his life. And uh, we were out for a walk and it was springtime, just around this time of year, exactly. And uh, we were out walking and he, he said, um, you know, his humor was a little corny, but very funny. And he said, um, we were walking by some tree. And he says, you know what kind of tree that is? And I said, no. 
And he says, it's dogwood. You know, you can tell from its bark. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you see the bark? <laughs> yeah. And anyway, he was, he was still also, he's very, he was, he was part Scottish and he, uh, you know, was also uh, noted to be extremely frugal. Ah. And, uh, even it, it's another another time we were out for a walk, and he actually he would if he saw a, pe a penny on the road on the sidewalk, he would definitely stop and pick it up. And we said, Darwin, you've got plenty of money. You've you've been you know on a good pension from Schenectady. You're very frugal. Why are you picking up a penny? He said, Well, I'm just honoring the presidents. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> He had one room, he and Gene had one room that was all archives and and a lot of incredible, um, you know, video, there wasn't video back then, but film of Baba wow. and then amazing photographs. He was actually a pretty good photographer. And I remember a couple times he would just pull out this picture. He has the mostly in slides because that's the best way to preserve them and they're most clear because they were in slides so once in a while he would pull out a couple of these slides of baba and um you'd have the little viewfinder for the slide and he would put a slide in it and you realize that you're looking at a slide of mayor baba that darwin took and the light that had come bounced off of baba come into the camera was direct on that original slide that he showed us and there was I tell you there was a lot of energy in those slides because he yeah, kept yeah. the whole room was filled with writings amazing stuff wow uh, Padre had the the habit of you know saying oh more you know I hear the loonies are coming you know <laughs> and he, he referred to the westerners as loonies and even uh, Muhammad the Must, you know, he would say, uh, "Madman from Bombay." We were all madmen from Bombay. But <laughs> one time, this nice uh, uh, van pulls up in, you know, at uh, Marabad, a whole bunch of people from, you know, probably Pune or Bombay, and he, he comes out and he says, "Oh no, more loonies." <laughs> and the people thought that it might be like a, a, a lunatic asylum and they got it back in and drove off. <laughs> <laughs> so um, how are we for time, Angela? What do you think? It looks good to have a moment of silence if you're... Okay. J. Bob. Well, here we are again. Inner Life 303. <laughs> no, I guess it's 202. It's the second time around. You, can you hear me all right? Uh, so uh, I was just going to say last time, you know, I brought up this metaphor of uh, the, the how good and love relate. I mean, uh, Darwin talks about it in the good bad scale, but how good and love relate. And I gave the figure of uh, someone riding a bike. And as long as you are riding and <clears throat> still, uh, well, before you can access love and live from love, from Baba's love and intuition, it's helpful to have the, uh, the um, training wheels of good. You know, but eventually you move over from uh, using good and relying upon it. And once you get into the Baba's love and everything, you can you can get rid of the training wheels. You know, that's the that's the the metaphor. But I'm gonna uh, just share this in my own life, how Baba kind of uh, worked on that for me. Back in the '70s. <clears throat> um, 
you know, a lot of women would come to the center, single mothers, and they would, you know, usually have just one child at that point. And it was very difficult life. I mean, I could tell, I could feel how difficult being a single mother, you had to work. And then when you came home, you, you, you know, you had to take care of your child who's generally needed a lot of help and you have no, no husband or if you, if you don't have any relatives in the area, it is a tremendous, uh, tremendous responsibility. So what I would, so often the single mothers would sit on that bench between the original kitchen and the lagoon camp, you know, with their child. And sometimes they would go into the lagoon cabin and spend some time, but then the child wouldn't be uh, start acting up, so they'd have to leave. So they would. So the very invariably, the single mother would be sitting there, and I would drive by in a truck. And I thought, well, it would be a good thing just to. I, I would say, if it was a boy, I would say, um, Sha, I, I can take your son for a while. He can come out and help me clean cabins or work on the grounds and everything. And and the mother was more than happy to get some, you know, uh, you know, uh, babysitting. So I'd take the kid in the truck and we'd drive off and we'd do things and we'd have a really good time. But sometimes, and, and if it was a, a little girl, I'd get, I'd get another caretaker. So there were two of us besides the little girl. And, um, you know, sometimes I would be very exhausted at the end when I come back a couple hours later, and sometimes I would feel enlivened. And, you know, I, it was puzzling, but then Baba kind of brought home to me the distinction between good and love. And I found that if I drove by the, that bench and I felt prompted by love, then I would stop and, and take the kid on. But if I, you know, but, if I didn't, if I just kind of felt I should help, you know, I should be there, I should give her relief, that should, the should would, when I did it uh, out, of, out of goodness, uh, out of being good, I found it very exhausting. When I went by the prompting of love, it would be uh, enlivening. And so I stopped, you know, just helping, just, you know, sometimes I go past several times or over a period of days, but then some time when I was riding by the truck, I would feel, ah, love wants to, is prompting me. And so I would, you know, I would get out and, and take the kid. So I'm just saying is good, when I was being good, I, I had to draw upon my own energy, my own sanskaric energy, and it is a limited supply. When love was the doer, when Baba's love was in the picture, then I could draw on his unlimited energy, unlimited. So it played out. I could see it, how it played out in my own life. And I'm going to read one little passage because uh, this is very interesting. I read this back in those times and it kind of surprised me, but this is what Baba said. If the aspirant were to seek opportunities for himself to render service, it would be a form of selfishness. In service that re which really counts in the spiritual life, there can be no thought of self at all. There should be no necessity felt to be to have something for oneself or of being the one who can give something to others. The self in all its forms has to be left entirely out of the picture. Service should spring out of the spontaneity of freedom if and when it is necessary. And it has to come in the cooperative spirit in which there is no insistence upon the claims of the limited I. I don't know if that makes sense or I read it too fast, but I was, you know, that was stunning that if you were to seek opportunities for service, it would be a form of selfishness. So Baba, you know, you kind of, you have to be very patient and wait until love uh, does the prompting. Sometimes love doesn't prompt me. And so I have to do the good thing. 
I prefer not to do the good thing, but sometimes this situation requires you got to do something. So I take good off the shelf. Uh, but it requires, you know, being kind of in a place of quiet and everything so that love can, uh, from Baba can pass through us. So anyway. That gives you a little uh, my own practical experience with that. Okay, Angela. All right, we're on page 75 of the book, page 44 of the PDF, the section called I Am Not Good. The pendulum swings back and forth between I am good and I am bad until we see that we are neither good or bad. Baba discusses the difficulties we often have of realizing that our goodness is a limitation. It is not that we dismantle our good, but that we dismantle our abode of identification with good by perceiving that it is yet another limitation that we must shed. Our identity is the problem, but we realize the truth that we are neither good nor bad. We think we have to be one or the other. We tend to try to make a good ego rather than simply letting the ego dissolve. It is a psychological secret that if we are willing to drop the assertion of good, we can slough off the bad. For example, if I have done something that makes you feel I am bad, you cannot just say, I'll re I renounce that I am bad because it implies that instead I am good. This is what is meant by the pendulum swinging back and forth. However, you can say, I renounce that I am either good or bad. As spirit, I am free. A radical way to rise above good and bad is to counteract the false judgment, I am bad, by recognizing and asserting, I am not good. This is not another way of saying, I am bad. It is a way of stopping the pendulum altogether by denying the ego stance of, I am good. Only when the pendulum st is stopped can we rise above the dual level? Applying the analogy of a chess game, we are using our reasoning minds to make certain moves to counteract those of the limited ego. To make this rather surprising chess move from I am bad to I am not good, we have to be willing to let go of the idea that I am good. In this way, we nullify both of those self-judgments and open the way to truth, which is beyond good and bad. This is a big blow to the limited ego. It is all part of the chess game of what Baba called the conquest of the unconscious. Yeah, so um, I guess I'm curious about if anybody's thoughts about like when, when Darwin was talking about um, dissolving the ego and this process of recognizing um, though, I mean, I'm just going off of what I took from this. Like, is he saying something along the lines of like, basically if you recognize everything that happens, if you, uh, I don't know, something about this is like, w I relate it with like, if things happen in my life right now, uh, good things, bad things, uncomfortable things, awkward moments, I'm, there's a sort of recognition that like, I just sort of try to say like, yes, Baba. And, yeah, and it's like, okay, that too, rather than having a reaction to like, oh, I can't believe this is happening to me again, or, you know, why this? And then when the good things happen, I'm like, oh, yes, I just want to saturate in this. Please don't take me away from this. <laughs> it's like, I feel like it, what we're talking about or what he's mentioning is sort of like a, 
is like the practice of detachment in a way where you still live your life, you do your things, you're practical, but you're also recognizing that there's just, I don't, yeah, there's that, that middle ground, or I don't know what it is. I don't know how to say it, but that's what I that took from it. I, I don't know if it's a question, but. Yeah, no, good. Now, it, we'll see if anyone uh, responds to what Alan says, but <clears throat> we have other people online, and we'll come back to that, Alan, if, if, uh, <clears throat> if the next two people have a different thing to say. Rosalie? Yeah, I, I uh, heard that uh, Margaret Files was uh, the godchild to Margaret Kress. And Margaret Kress told her, you don't have to be good. You just have to be God. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> oh, that's the whole thing right there. That's so, so simple. <laughs> you got you to gotta pick the right godmother. Right? Oh, yeah. Good choice and godmother. And Ken and Betty. Hi. Okay, that would be me. Um, so when I first was, was looking at this and reading it, I wasn't, it wasn't really resonating with me. But then I realized I have often believed that the major problem um, that we create in many ways is separation, a belief in separation, that we're not, you know, we're not one. That, so my personal belief is, I call it like holy oneness. There just is a oneness. And the problem with I am good is it is, in a sense, creating separation. That's the ego part of it. It's creating separation. I'm good. That's my identity. So good for me. I'm good. Ego feels great. But it's not good. Why? Because it's separating myself off in the good box. And the truth is, that love can only come from not being in that box, from being in the place of what I call holy oneness, of, of connection and I am, I am not bad, I am not good. I am I'm part of the whole. Yeah. So that's what this, that's what this says to me. Excellent. Beautifully, <clears throat> beautifully conveyed. Excellent. <clears throat> yeah, because if you if you say you're good, then there got to be some bad people out there. <laughs> and Ruth? <clears throat> yeah, Che Baba. Um, yeah, I woke up today and I just felt so washed in Baba's grace. And I just laid in my bed and just started to cry. It was so beautiful. And immediately my mind hopped on that and said, geez, I don't know, you know, I don't know why you think you get grace because I don't know, you're certainly not worthy of this experience. and. You know, you really shouldn't. And then it was like, well, no, wait, I'm good. I I'm not bad. And then that quickly, I got it that I was not really either. It wasn't about, it was two sides of the ego coin. Do you know what I mean? It's like that, that Baba says that, you know, when you go at yourself from that other side of how, how unworthy you are and how bad you are. And it's like you're, um, you're going at it from the other side rather than saying how great I am. You're saying, Oh my God, but it's the ego. It's just the ego. It's the coin of the ego. And uh, so the coin was kind of clear pretty quickly this morning in that experience. And I was able to kind of just throw it off the bed for a minute and just try to be peaceful with Baba. 
So that was good to have that, you know, understanding come to me quickly. Um, and grateful for the grace. Reading things like what Darwin's talking about, you know, you, you can you kind of get a leg up on the tricks, you know, <clears throat> the good, bad scale and love. <clears throat> Now, Alan, <clears throat> did did were any were any of these sharings uh, did that help a little bit with that? Yeah, yeah, it's it's all it's like different sides. Yeah, I mean, uh, Don Stevens talked about a neutral plateau. You know, where you kind of get get to a place behind, so you're not going with being good or being bad. Sometimes you can go to love, but sometimes <clears throat> you can't necessarily go to love, but you, you, you can at least go to a neutral place. I don't know if that makes sense, but you know, you're, you're watching this stuff going by and you're not really in that state of love, but you're not buying into the good, bad, and the, the, the good, bad continuum. Hey, uh, I was just remembering uh, something that happened to me <clears throat> in India, which kind of uh, worked with this part of myself, the good, bad continuum. It was my last day in Maribah, in Marizad, and I was just extremely emotional. And um, I climbed over, I climbed the hill and um, came back late. So everyone had already sort of had, what happened was, um, Meru had taken a mango from that special tree that the must uh, pit had grown and she had cut it up and given everyone pieces of the mango. And um, she saved me this beautiful choice piece of mango because I was leaving. And so as I, I was about to eat it and then all of a sudden I had this thought go through my mind and it was like, what happened to the pit of this mango? I said to her. And she goes, well, it's in the kitchen. And I said, well, could I have, she said, do you want the pit? I said, yes, yes. Cause I was thinking I might grow it at home and maybe make, have it for a long time and not just eat it quickly and have it gone, right? So I said, yes. And she said, well, you could either have one or the other. You can have the mango or the pit. And she was very firm and stern, you know? And I, and I sort of sat there and I said, okay, I'll take the pit. So she gives me the pitch, she takes away the mango. And then I, uh, have I told the story before to you guys? No. <laughs> and so I, I came down and um, I was getting ready to go on the bus and I was extremely emotional because my last time before I'd leave. And um, I asked, and so there was somebody there who worked there and um, I'm, I was crying, you know, and she said, what's wrong? And I said, well, I don't know if I made the right choice. You know, I, I could have had this beautiful mango as Baba's Prasad and I, I kind of pushed it away. Instead, I asked for something different and maybe I really screwed up. And, and she goes, oh yes, that was very bad. Very, very bad that you did that. <laughs> and, and she said, you never turn away Baba's Prasad. And, and so I was just really, uh, you know, was just beside myself. I get on the bus. And speaking of Dolly, so Dolly comes over to me um, and sees me crying on the bus. And she said, what's the matter? I told her the story. And she goes, no, 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 no. I'm sure they were very pleased with that choice. She said, I mean, you why did you want the pit? You wanted to grow it at home so you could take care and care for this and have mangoes all the time. That would extend forever, right? I'm sure the Mendeley women were very pleased with this. So, okay, so that's kind of the whole story. But basically... Was I good? Was I bad? And so I had this um, great teaching that I'm definitely neither. And I did take the mango pit home and it grew into a little plant. And that's a whole other story, but it was really remarkable uh, that, that I could make it, that it would grow. Um, but anyways, I kind of took from that, that I was neither bad nor good. That's my story. <clears throat> Beautiful. Wow. That's a great story. <laughs> And Mahu? Um, one thing that actually has helped me throughout the years uh, is when I uh, got introduced to the concept uh, 
of provisional ego in discourses by beloved Baba. Um, by that, I, I think, uh, and, and by putting it to use, if whatever that we do, we declare that uh, Baba is doing this, Baba is doing that, Baba is taking shower now, he's driving, he's eating, he's uh, you know, napping and, what's, and so forth. Eventually, Baba is the one who is doing everything. Now, in the beginning, when, when we do it, it could be done mechanically because we're new to the concept but eventually Baba comes, in my opinion, comes and take over and it becomes real. So of course, ego is, is there to perpetuate itself. And with my experience, um, Darwin only um, emphasized on good, I am good uh, in response to I am bad. He thinks that ego is coming to save us. I said, no, I'm good. That means I'm not bad. But we don't even go there. By this concept of provisional ego, we don't even go to self-evaluation, self-importance, self-judgment, self-rescuing, uh, self-this, self-that. It's just that one more shortcut that Baba provided as just don't take yourself out of the equation. Just take yourself totally out of the equation and only put the master in place. The master is doing this. The master is doing that. The master is taking care of this. And guess what? Then really something really good happens. I internally believe Baba did it. There's no way I could do it. There's no way. Really his hands is in it. He better believe it. Otherwise it's gonna go pass by you. We better believe it. He is doing it. He, his agents, whomever. Uh, this this afternoon, something happened, and I, I mentioned. I was mentioned to the family. I said, "You know that invisible hands took care of it today. You can't believe it. How well it got done. That invisible hand. I couldn't say Baba. You know, they're not so much with Baba as much as I just. No, but that that the protector." The protector that is taking care of us really came and helped us, which really he did. I mean, it's gonna be a big story if I wanna go through it, but that's it. You know, I mean, I, I, that works for me. The concept of provisional ego and putting Baba first. And by that, you don't even think about the result. Because by looking at the result and have certain expectations uh, is when you evaluate, you become disappointed. So it says, oh, I'm not good. Actually, your ego gets disappointed because as Darwin says, it identify itself with that uh, incident. Oh, you know, you didn't do good, so you're not good. You know, oh, you did well, so you're good. You know, like that, that ego identification um, happens and we get we get captured by it. We, we fall into that trap. Whereas let's just not pay attention to that damn ego. Really that damn ego. Just go straight to the Baba. Let him do it. Call out to him. Remember him. And that's it. Yep. You don't even yep. think that there is good, bad, I'm good, I'm bad, I'm not good, I'm, you know, like that. Yeah. That's my experience. Yeah, no, that, that's a beautiful articulation of plan A. <laughs> that's, I was waiting for and, that, uh, actually. <laughs> and then there's plan B, and people are moving from plan B to plan A, but that's it. Eventually, that's, that's the great place to be. I, I mean, this is an extreme version of this, but Margaret Crask used to say, <clears throat> you know, one time on the hill when she was with the women, this is the <clears throat> late 30s, as Hitler was, <clears throat> was conquering one country after another, and, and the women, Mondale, especially the Western women, were very upset, and Kitty was almost wanted to go back to London and help 
as the, as London was being bombarded and and the, they wanted to get back to Europe. They had that thought, <clears throat> and they brought it when Baba came up the hill. They brought that all up with them. And one of the last remarks that someone made was, "How can such an evil man like Hitler exist and get away with this?" And Baba spelled out on the alphabet board. That you, Margaret didn't, I heard this quite a few times from, from Margaret, but she never put it in the book. But Baba spelled out on the, on the alphabet board, did you ever consider that he might be suffering from an excess of good? And what, what kind of what I gathered from that is, is that in the last lifetime, he was so good but the pendulum swung well, instead of uh, the pendulum swinging from good over to love, it swung way back to extreme bad, extreme evil. And that's the, that's even one of the, you know, the greater dangers of getting too identified with good because you can bring up, you can invite the opposite. So I don't know if that, I mean, that's, I, I don't know. She never really put that in the book, but she said it many times from Baba. <clears throat> so yeah. good is not as good as you might think. <laughs> okay. Really? That's so profound. All right. Page 75. Sustained by grace. Sustained by grace. When we realize that the ego is clinging to a particular stance, we can make these kinds of counteracting chess moves. For example, instead of trying to protect and preserve our ego stance, we can assert, I am nothing. If we are not prepared to take the bold step of asserting our nothingness, we can say, I am sustained by Baba's grace, and therefore I, as the ego self, am nothing. And in fact, we are sustained not by our goodness or badness, but by, Bob, by the master's grace. Grace deals with, quote, sin or weaknesses by raising our consciousness and dispelling our notions of being subject to the causes of so-called sin. Because grace has within its context omnipotence, for grace is synonymous with truth and divine love. We must eventually stop basing our sense of who we are on the illusory values of good and bad and accept being sustained by grace. So is he saying, um, this is the fairy godmother. Um, is, is he saying that we shouldn't think of ourselves as either good or bad? Just how should we think of ourselves? Well, I mean, he gave two, uh, <clears throat> two answers there. One, think of yourself as nothing or nobody. And the other is, you know, it, where he says, I am sustained by Baba's grace, and therefore I, as the ego self, am nothing. It's a whole different paradigm from what we're used to. Mm -hmm. You know, it, I mean, it's, it's like trying on a, new pair of shoes, you know, got to yeah, get comfortable with them. It's like all these self-help movements. They say you got to have high self-esteem and all that. Yeah, it's not, uh, I mean, Darwin says, you know, uh, humility or self-effacement without egoism, without, without low self, excuse me, without low self-esteem. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a combination, but uh, that's how Darwin kind of describes it. It's Can you say it again, Jeff? Um, Self-effacement without 
low self-esteem. Feeling you're nothing without feeling bad about yourself, you know, not making a big deal of yourself, but not making a lowly deal of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a, it, like I say, these are unusual paradigms that Darwin is introducing, that Baba has introduced, and Darwin is putting it into another, <laughs> into in English in a different way. Jeff Asbell? This question of don't think things as either good or bad. We have to function sometimes and make discerning decisions. Do I get the COVID vaccine or don't I? Do I leave Nazi Germany when I have information that they're going to round up the Jews? Do I go to Canada when I know I'm gonna be drafted to the Vietnam War, when I know it's based on a few people making a lot of money with ammunitions and food consortiums. So I wish I could ask Papa what I'm offering because I'm not anywhere near the awareness of nothing is neither good nor bad. In the world that we live in, we have a little baby that looks like something is up. You try to take that baby to the specialist because you want that baby to get the best and you have to make a good decision because if you make a bad decision and don't take the baby to the pediatrician. So I'm wondering, and I asked this question really, don't we have to many times look at a situation and make the good decision because if we make a bad decision, you know, sometimes it's life and death. Sometimes it's yeah. pain and suffering happen if I make that bad decision and a student is placed not in the right special ed class for his disability. And six months later, he's mm -hmm. acting out and yeah. No, so I, how do you respond to good or bad? I, I don't, I don't Darwin, get it. Is not, Darwin is not saying not to be practical about good and bad situations. Just don't identify yourself with being a good or bad person. You can do good things and loving things and good things, but don't identify your, it's, it's the identity, not the, not giving up practical. I mean, you get out of Germany, <laughs> Uh, when you when you suspect there's things going on, but it's it's identifying yourself. I'm good or bad, but you can't be, you know, it'd be impractical to ignore, uh, you know, the the consequences. I thought it was read that Darwin wrote. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sorry if I am. Don't look at things as good or bad. I'm not trying to split hairs, yeah, yeah. you know, I, 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 I don't know. Of course, you're right about don't think of yourself as good. You're an instrument of God. You're a link in a chain. You do what needs to be done to work with Baba, of course. But <laughs> that last sentence, read that last sentence there. Where it says, uh, we must eventually stop basing our sense of who we are on the illusory values of good and bad. But uh, it, yeah, it doesn't, he's not saying not to, <clears throat> not well, I'm to very, I have to apologize, I'm very sorry. I misheard yeah. it. Oh, that's a good point though. A good distinction. Well, you're very kind, yeah. Jeff. <laughs> no, no, it was. <clears throat> Good, we, good. Need, we need more samples. <laughs> we yeah. need more samples, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yes, yeah, so I, I was looking in the discourses, and um, there's a whole chapter on that in volume one, um, Good and Evil. Um, I'll read one paragraph. The general process of freeing oneself from the limitation of sanskaras has, therefore, 
to be accompanied by the process of renouncing the bad for the good. But whether a person happens to be good or bad at any given time is dependent upon the inexorable operation of his sanskaras. From this point of view, the sinner and the saint are both what they are according to the laws operative in the universe. They have both the same beginning and the same end. The sinner need not have the stigma of eternal degradation and the saint need not have pride in his moral attainments. No one, however saintly he may be, has attained the heights of moral virtues except after a life of moral failings. And no one is so bad as to be unable to improve and become good. Everyone, no matter how depraved, can gradually become better and better until he becomes the best example for all mankind. There is always hope for everyone. None is utterly lost and none need despair. It remains true, however, that the way to divinity lies through the renunciation of evil in favor of the good. And he goes on to talk about the good and the evil being the state of duality and that there's the end result should be the, um, the uh, try here, here it is. So um, page 95, the prison of good. However, in the course of time, the aspirant gets tired of his new prison house, meaning of being um, good all the time. And after the perception, this perception, he surrenders his separative existence by, quote, transcending the duality of good and bad. And there's more. But anyway, that said, being a human being that I am, I, I also find it really difficult to not want to, quote, be good because the culture I was raised in. So I was raised going to a church every Sunday of my life. And, you know, traditionally, um, you're always working to be good and to avoiding what is considered, I mean, what is bad, you know. So the, the shift to the, this shift that Darwin's talking about is a total shift in consciousness from this good bad to something that's totally different. And I'm just starting to understand it. But do I live that way? No. You know, I just went out in my garden and my beautiful hollyhocks, which take two years to grow and produce flowers, were sprayed by the, <laughs> by the gardening people because they did not know. And so what did I do? I started cursing those idiots <laughs> for ruining my garden. Now, that's not good. I'm saying they're bad, you know, but so am I by, you know, feeling that way. I'm just saying that um, we are culturally trained just... Uh, some of us are, not everybody. I'm just, I'm, I'll speak from my experience. It is really hard to think that one should not be good. That one, you know, and of course, Bob is not saying don't be good, but to, to kind of think that you're, to feel really great about yourself because you're being, quote, good. And um, to feel bad about yourself if you're being bad or to express that judgment Put that judgment on others. I mean, I know I do it. I shouldn't do it, but I do do it. But I just think it shows how difficult it is to really. I mean, like, for example, if I were to give up being being good. If I told people in the church that I could do now about that, they would think I was just really a terrible person. They would not understand. I don't think um, it's hard to explain. I won't explain it unless there's a really, really close friend who has more an, of an intuitive understanding of, or spiritual understanding of a lot of things beyond. Not everybody can take it in is what I'm trying to say. It's, it's too difficult. And I even, I mean, I should, I should be able to do that, but I find myself automatically not doing it. It's easier to not do than to do. I have to consciously think, um, I am nothing or Bob is doing this before I can get past it. And that is a relatively new phenomenon. I've, I've, so I think it's really um, natural that people are having a hard time with this because, and that's probably because I think it's natural for me <laughs> because it's unnatural for me to do it differently at this point in time. Anyway, I probably said too much, but 
Hey, Bob. Oh, that's, that's the great challenge right there. <clears throat> yeah, and Damien? Yeah, there's a couple, just two things that it struck me. One is, I remember Darwin would always say that um, it's actually a very, very helpful spiritually to have normal, healthy self-esteem. And at first I thought, wow, that that seems a little like your ego could get involved in that. But I think he was making the point of just when we go through life, it's helpful uh, to keep our equipoise to make good decisions, just have basic good health, healthy self-esteem. Um, and that makes sense to me. Uh, the other thing that really just struck a chord in me was when I was saying, I, I definitely can't do the, I am nothing. I am definitely not there. But uh, <laughs> that's like, you know, I might be a nothing for a moment, but that's about it. But Good um, for nothing? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, he said, um, if we, you know, instead of asserting our nothingness, we can say, I am sustained by Baba's grace. And therefore, the small I, I am nothing. And I, I just had a, um, the last few years, I had a wonderful example of this stronger than I'd ever had before in my life. Um, a number of you might have known that I worked um, to try to save the last high dunes here in North Myrtle Beach. And it's a beautiful, magical place uh, about five miles north of the center. And um, kind of impossible because it was privately owned and they were going to bulldoze these beautiful high wooded sand dunes with live oaks on them. Um, but it was privately owned, so they had the right to do everything. But um, basically, I was I was working at it, and then um, Larry and Rita said to me, "Well, you should ask Baba to help." And I said, "Well, I don't. I've never really asked Baba to help directly with something, but I did, and I asked Baba and Mara to help save these dunes very specifically." But what it did was it really freed me up um, because I asked from the depth of my heart and it really, um, I said, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it 100%. So I went into Baba's room and asked Baba and Mara to help save these dunes. And then it went on for another <clears throat> almost three years and two and a half years. And I could see it went up and down. Like one week it would be up, the next week it would be going down. But um, well, I guess what happened was I realized in the end, this impossible situation, it was sustained by Baba's grace and, and Mara's grace too, who loved nature. Um, so I guess it, what it did was it, it got me out of the way and then I could just do the work that had to be done and realize that in reality, this was Baba's grace that happened. It was a powerful example that I never would have had um, except for this situation uh, that I put my heart into. So it was a, it was a real mm -hmm. blessing. I, as wonderful as it was, it was an incredible blessing to see Baba's grace in action. And it got me out of the way. Beautiful. As much as I could, you know, not completely, of course, but. And <laughs> that, that grace is there as a preserved uh, dunes and, and forested area. Yeah. They did get saved, most of them. Yeah. So. Fighting against uh, heavy duty real estate uh, investment. Yeah. Um, I like to go by this uh, words of Baba. Remember, Jeff, you were there when Charles talked about the favorite put up Baba by Jane Hens. Yeah. Uh, and of course, this is one of my most favorite as well. 
Bob was said uh, to them when they met uh, him and also Phyllis and Adele, said, let these words be inscribed in your heart. Nothing is real but God. Nothing matters but love for God. So these are not just words. <laughs> there is a deep ocean perhaps meaning is behind it. And uh, to put it to work, it takes the effort and grace book. It, it takes another book by uh, Darwin. It takes this course says God speaks and whatnot. Uh, but aside from that, uh, um, you know, I, I'm just gonna share my experience, okay? So when Darwin is writing these words, it comes from his higher consciousness. And obviously he worked uh, for a place to be a Darwin. Nothing comes easy. It's not, we can't just earn the master's grace. It's, there's a work involved and uh, we all know that. I just, I don't even have to say that. But um, we could all be a Darwin. Can't we? Because this is our opportunity. Meher Baba is manifesting. The gate is open. The love is overflowing. Mandalis are gone. It's a post mandali era. It's us and Baba. Even Darwin is not around. Esfandiar is not around. No Mandalis are around. It's just us and Baba. So in my opinion, I mean, in my little take is if we rely on him only and knowing that he is the only doer, he is the only doer and, and give everything that we do, good or bad or whatever, I don't even know what is good and what is bad anymore, to be honest with you. Uh, because it's that sense of discernment and everybody's is different. Uh, but just give everything the result of the work. Like you do exercise, Baba, this was yours. I'm offering this to you and your creation. You're the one who did it. And so forth. After a while, uh, practice makes it perfect. You don't even think about, so what should I do? Should I say I'm good or should I say I'm bad? That thought, I'm sorry to say that, but definitely is ego that is perpetuating itself again. It says, wait a minute now, you're not taking yourself seriously? You are somebody, so you got to declare yourself as either you're good, you're bad, or you're nothing. Okay? So this ego, per ego work and how he's... The, in at the most stumbling block in our uh, path, we got to recognize it and triumph over it. That's why in Sustained by Grace, Darwin talks about uh, instead of trying to protect and preserve our ego instance, rely it on, well, he's giving a little bit of discount here. He says, well, then say, I'm nothing. By the grace of Baba, I am nothing. Well, I wouldn't even say I'm nothing. I say it's all Baba's grace. He's, a, he's the one who's doing it. Who am I? Yeah? You know, like that. So I guess, and I, 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 I appreciate Elizabeth's honesty. There is a, perhaps there's a Western upbringing. There is a, uh, a, a, a lifestyle that we are accustomed to and so forth. And that always kicks in and that's only being natural. But uh, that, that's why we have Meher Baba. We just have to go about the, against the flow. If the society tells us, declare yourself doing this, are you doing vaccine, mm -hmm. not doing vaccine, this and that, but vaccine is my body. Why do I even have to talk about it to anyone, right? I mean, just seeing everything in the light of the God-man, just see the light of the God-man 
just surrounding you. Let him take care of your vaccine. Let him take, I'm not saying that you be lazy, don't take responsibility uh, and so forth. No, Baba's wish, the six Baba's wish stands. Attend faithfully to your responsibility. Do not shirk your responsibility, but say all of this is Baba. In the back of your mind, say it is Baba. I mean, the third one, whatever situation you're in, just say Baba put me here. You know, and on and on and on. So uh, yeah, those things is, is, is what is in, in my mind. Thank you. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm gonna oversimplify this, but um, you know, Jeff, I really like watching yourself go by. <laughs> That's really a nice, uh, a nice perspective. And I think it is a matter of perspective. Um, and I had a friend once, this is back in the 60s when we, you know, spoke this way. He used to say, uh, don't dig one half of the swing, you know, like a swing set, you know, dig the whole thing. And the real meaning of that is not forward and back. It's that forward and back are locations, but you're on a ride. So, you know, get the distance from yourself, watch yourself go by, you know. Um, and, you know, the, the notion is that it's all God, it's all one. It begins with God, in the middle it's God, and at the end it's God. So, you know, to kind of simplify it, it seems like that's the central question. Um, in the beginning, unconscious, maybe God's not clear, but God's trying to say, I am God. <laughs> you know, unconscious, not clear on it, let's get clear on it. So in the middle, spirit moving the soul gets the idea, I'm it. I'm the one, right? Except we get in that situation and we find that there's others. And we're not the only one. I, I mean, I'm it. I'm the one. Well, who's that? You know, I'm sitting on a bus on a seat. Somebody sits down too close to me, next to me. What are you doing here? You know, I'm the one. This is mine. You know, <laughs> we, we have to find solutions to reconcile that somehow we have that central theme. I'm God. But that's not that that's not our experience. So to me, good and bad are not identities. They're lessons. You know, there's a part of me that knows, in essence, I'm God. But I have to reconcile that with the fact that my experience tells me, wait a minute, I'm not all that. I don't have everything I need. I have to recognize and depend on others. And it seems like that's what life is about. It's learning that we are interdependent, that we're not whole unless we're all one. And, and that, you know, means friendship and dependency, interdependency, love, you know, moving toward that union. And in that process, it seems to me that we learn lessons by the choices we make. I could share or I could steal or I could give or I could take or I could harm or I could do good or whatever but they're all attempted solutions to, as Baba said, answer the question, who am I? Because we come in thinking, no, we're not clear on it. I'm the one, there's only one. We find out we're not because there's others that are here. <laughs> and then somehow we have to reconcile that and come back to the I am one all inclusively but it's God, 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 beginning, middle, and end. And we just have different perspectives on that and try to solve the problem differently. Yeah. Wonderful. 
someone said Baba, Baba's Baba. Yeah. <laughs> That's the whole. Yeah, just a couple of points uh, just before getting on this call. I was reading in another book where Darwin said that the Mondale all had very strong self confidence, but their egos were gone. Their egos were out of it. And it didn't mean they didn't have personalities, you know, they, they all had really distinct personalities, but it was in service to Baba. And I think that he had cleaned them out so well, and they were so devoted to him that he really came through uh, their, their different personalities and the different people who they were. And then uh, Mani used to tell this great little story. She went to uh, was a Christian or Catholic girl's school, right, Jeff, when yeah. she was young. And she had a very good friend, Catholic girl named Mary. And she said, Mary was so good. God, she was good. And, but she was so good, I think she missed God. Mm -hmm. And it was, a, it was a great line. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> no, they're <clears throat> the Monoli were great examples of <clears throat> being effaced and yet very distinct and colorful personalities. Very expressive. I have a lot of thoughts about this chapter, you know, and it's it's due for reread right now. Um, you know, it's interesting uh, that term being good. I I have a thing with a sibling, and I call him Goody Two Shoes. I, I don't I don't think that's a wonderful thing being good, you know. Um, but at any rate, I, I found this little quote and I have written down, interestingly enough, it says blue bus, it was Baba's birthday in Ashmir in 1939. And Baba said it, come to me all who are in need, good or bad, in me is life immune. And I thought it was very timely. In me oh. is life immune. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. one other thing is, you know, when something quotes horrible happens, you don't hear people saying that's God's grace. It is in a certain sense, isn't everything God's grace? Because nothing happens except by the will of God. You know, I, I don't get that. It, oh, wow, that's grace. Uh, you know, it's a little tricky. And, and also this, this brings up my Catholic upbringing where there were venial sins and there were mortal sins. And then there was sacrilege that was off the chart. Well, uh, you know, I, I don't go there anymore. And, you know, sometimes discussions go there, you know, and, um, uh, you know, it, it's a it's a tricky subject. You know, let love well up, like you're saying, Jeff. And if it doesn't well up, I mean, and it's funny. We started this at page seventy five, and in Kali Yuga, seventy five percent selfishness, twenty five percent selflessness. It's so perfect that we started at page seventy five to discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I oh, just have, thank you, Rosalie. <laughs> it's it's a it's a tricky subject, you know. Yep. Life is tricky. Yeah. And Good. I, hey, Jay Baba. Um, for me, the practical spirituality part of it is ha, uh, what has helped me is the encouragement to be natural. That's helped me so much because um, I think about doing the next right thing. 
um, not necessarily the next good thing. Um, you know, like if somebody wants something from me in a caretaking way that I'm not willing to give, or I think they're being manipulative or whatever, I don't have to please other people in that way. I don't feel like it's healthy or good for them or for me. So I can, you know, I can say, let me think about it and take it to Bob in prayer and then come back and say, no, sorry, that can't do it, you know, and be perfectly comfortable and happy with that. And that is something that I've had to mature in over the years. Um, and I really just cling to and share with other people the idea of being natural, because I think that's where the answer is, you know, for me anyway. Um, and just one last kind of aside is when I first came to Baba, uh, right after my misspent youth, I was so happy to hear that the greatest sinners made the greatest saints. I thought, yeah, this is the path for me. So just kidding, but thank you. To <laughs> Baba. I keep unmuting the wrong button. Um, so I'm just taking us back to the discourses again. And this is volume two, sixth edition revised. So on page um, 77, they talk about two complexes and that they're flip sides of the other, the superiority and the inferiority. <clears throat> and um, it says the superiority complex and the inferiority complex for the most part remain disconnected from each other. They both seek separate and alternative expression through suitable objects as when a person dominates those whom he regards as his inferiors and submits to those whom he looks upon as his superiors. But such alternative expression through contrasting behavior only accentuate these opposite complexes instead of leading to their dissolution. And then it goes on. And then at the end of the chapter, in, some, uh, in page 84, Review of Evolution, this actually says basically what Ken said, uh, Ken and Betty. Um, eventually, so uh, it says uh, ego gradually adjusts itself. This eventually turns out to be so great that in the end of the, in the end, the ego as an affirmation of separateness completely disappears and is sub substituted by the truth with a capital T, which knows no separateness. The intermediate steps of slimming down the ego and softening its nature are comparable to the trimming and pruning of the branches of a wild and mighty tree, while the final step of annihilation of the ego amounts to the complete uprooting of this tree. When the ego disappears entirely, there arises knowledge of the true self with a capital S. This is the long journey of the soul Thus, the long journey of the soul consists in developing from animal consciousness to the explicit self-consciousness as a limited I, then in transcending the state of the limited I through the medium of the master. At this stage, the soul is initiated into the consciousness of the supreme and real self, both capitalized as an everlasting and infinite I am in which there is no separateness and which ex includes all existence. Beautiful, yeah. Okay, I just want to go back to the sentence on page 75. Um, I renounce that I am either good or bad. As spirit, I am free. And then I kept thinking, well, you know, Baba says to detach. So when we have actions and things, we don't act on it. But then the best thing I could say is, don't worry, be happy, do the best you can and leave the rest to Baba because we're not in control of any of that. So that's all I wanted to add. <laughs> yeah. so, so here's something that Darwin, <clears throat> he told me had a cosmic experience from reading this. Uh, I, I'm gonna only read a portion of it, be, uh, but my, the whole circumstances of how this came about, <clears throat> it will be interesting, I'll, I'll share it sometime. But this is what Baba said to Balkhout Shuri. With me, no one can live what the world considers a moral life. Here we are concerned with spirituality 
not morals. A spiritual life is not ruled nor bound by any principles. The sun scars of each one are different, and so the behavior and temperament of everyone are different. So here's the interesting, <clears throat> in a virtuous life, or we can say a good life, evil is suppressed and good surfaces, but the evil is still there. The bad sun scars remain and have to be worked out, if not in this life, then in the next or the one after. In the spiritual life, both good and bad sun scars express themselves and both get nullified. The spiritual life leads one toward naturalness. That's what Rita was saying. A spiritual life leads one toward naturalness, whereas a virtuous life in the guise of humility inflates the ego and perpetuates it. The spiritual life, though, is only led under the guidance and orders of the avatar or a perfect master who knows the pulse of everyone and treats everyone according to his or her malady. <clears throat> but that is very interesting that, I mean, Baba kind of lays it out and that, that had a very powerful uh, effect on Darwin. <clears throat> that it's not a moral universe as we take it to be. <clears throat> is to free us up, you know. Anyway. Self-effacement does not mean self-persecution. If God loves us, which he does, then we can also love ourselves. But we must also forgive ourselves. It is important that we do so because we are not guilty. We are not the body or the personality, but the untarnished soul. If we must have, if we must have an ego stance, why not identify with the statement, I am purity instead of I am guilty. We approach the beloved as nothing no position, no merit, and no stance. We are open books to him, and we have made countless errors, but he is the Lord of mercy, who continuously forgives us for our misdeeds and our false selves. He does not measure us. We are the limitless soul, and that is how he sees us. Our refuge is in his love for us. Um, <clears throat> but let's see, let, uh, is there anything to say about this particular thing? This is an incredible little paragraph, couple of paragraphs that we are not guilty. I mean, that's, <clears throat> that is, That is really revolutionary. Gabriella? Well, I've been, this is an amazing chapter. Maybe we could continue more on this next time because um, it's extremely evocative. And I see it as kind of a whole life experience that I started as a young girl trying to please my parents. I wanted to be good, not bad. Then I rebelled and I was bad, 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 quote, you know. <laughs> and then I came to Baba and I was shoplifting. I was like 30 something and I was still shoplifting, you know. It's like something you should get over when you're 14. And I went to the center for the first time and Baba says to me, stop stealing, like from the picture, you know. And then I just, didn't deal with it, you know. I went home and it was really new to Baba. I didn't know how he worked at all, or how a master worked or anything. And I shoplifted and got caught after all these years, you know, got caught. And I was sitting there and that's when I had my moment of realization that Baba was really my master because he had tried to warn me and I didn't listen. And this, but way I see now in retrospect, many years later, 
is that I had these sanskaras that I was playing out and Baba brought them right up to the surface. And um, then I had quite a bit of uh, penance to do after that in various ways, which I will skip. But, um, and I stopped, oh, I stopped stealing, absolutely stopped stealing. And I also realized Baba was my master. And, and I guess that I see that still in my life now, I am integrating that this whole chunk of my life that I said, oh, you were bad, bad, bad. I wasn't bad, bad, bad. And that time after I stopped stealing and I started to try to do good with Baba, that wasn't good, good, good. And now it's like, I, I feel an integration happening or perhaps, yeah, and perhaps a detachment, however we want to call it. Um, and moving way away from that early childhood thing where I was trying to please my parents and all that really matters now is pleasing Baba. So um, I think, and I just, I, I, there's so much more, that's sort of like wanted to tell that little overview of one person's story of the good and the bad. And it's been a big deal in my life. And um, Lynn Ott once said to me, you really want to be good, don't you? And he started laughing at me, you know? And he said, you know, I like being bad. <laughs> and so anyway, you know, I, I'm so grateful that Baba is pulling me out of this morass of, you know, this, these sanskaras of being good or being bad. And he, he's, and my particular malady, he's very specific. Because I needed that, you know, I needed to be brought into out of that. All right, thank you, Al. Thanks for listening. Yeah, great, Gabriella. Beautiful. Wow. And look at, you know, you did a bad thing and you came to God. <laughs> you got caught, you stole, you got caught, and you got the avatar. <laughs> wow. Beautiful. Eric used to like me to tell that story. I was very embarrassed and he's, he's like, tell that story. <laughs> and Janet? Yeah, I just want to say um, this last little section is for me, it's just a, so much of an integration of the whole chapter. And even though I don't have a nearly a perfect understanding of each of the sections that we've gone over before and hashed out, you know, I think to each of our, uh, our struggle in a way, <laughs> at least this is how it appears to me, to really, to, to understand what Darwin is saying and what, what our role is and, and where we're going and, and, and what the path is. But this last section is just, you know, talking about Baba's mercy is so, and forgiveness and forgiving ourselves is, it, it's so overarching to me of the whole chapter. And anyway, it just <laughs> felt like a lot of grace in that last two paragraphs. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Janet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, it's a different paradigm, moving into a different paradigm. Wendy. Um, <clears throat> this final chapter reminds me a workshop that I was in and the lady orchestrating it, um, she said, it was on this topic, that whoever is present is meant to be there. Whatever was said and done was meant to be said and done. And when it's over, it's over. And I love that. And I don't know if that helps anybody, but that's what popped into my mind in this last bit. It's like when you can do that, you're less attached to it. That's it. Hey, Baba. <laughs> yeah. Good. Excellent. Yeah. And Rita. I had a dream last night that um, of a period in my life and a person in my life that was very hurtful. And um, I woke up with what I call kind of an emotional hangover. 
<clears throat> you know, with not good feelings, kind of ick, ick feelings. And, and I was, you know, laying there trying to, like Jeff says, feel the feelings and give them to Baba. And, but it was more like, you know, God, please take this person and, and all that bad stuff that happened and just, you know, wipe out these sense scares, get it away from me. And, you know, and all that kind of um, thinking, which really didn't turn out to be that helpful. But when I'm reading this last section, um, you know, I am not guilty and neither is that person. That's, that's what touched me in this last section. You know, it's like, just like Wendy was saying, what happens happens. Um, and it's not something I usually think about. It was just because of the stream that it came forward. And, and I'm grateful it did because um, I'm not guilty and neither is that person. Thanks. Beautiful. Yeah. And, and that expression, I am purity, is, is kind of outside of any kind of moral framework. I am purity. It's, it's uh, one, one interesting that he chose, I am purity as as counter to I am guilty. Well, especially since he said Mara is the purest soul of the universe. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and and if I were to put some money on it, I would put everything I had on Mara. Pure intention. I had never seen it before in my life. Well, you know, I happen to think that Bob has given various explanations of, of forgiveness, but one of them that I found was very interesting. It's kind of like this. If you had, if you murdered somebody in a dream and you came to Baba and said, Baba, please forgive me. I murdered somebody in a dream. And Baba says, nothing. I, I forgive you because it was just a dream. And it, I mean, in a way too, this is all a dream too, but it, we, we, it get, we make it so real. But, you know, it's, you know, it's, I mean, if Baba hadn't said that this is all an illusion, I don't think I would have come to that conclusion. I don't think I would have been looking for that truth. I mean, I might have, but he kind of set me on, on a course. Is this all? This is also all an illusion. It's a great help, I feel, so that you don't take everything so seriously and re uh, in, and severely. You know, at one level, Baba says it's all an illusion. As terrible as you've been. One part of you says it is, it helps to know that it's all an illusion as well. Anyway. Yeah, Ruth? Oh, just a quick reminder, I'm preaching to the choir here, but you know, Baba said that um, forgiveness was done at creation. He forgave us when he created. So, you know, we're asking for forgiveness, which has already been given. So anyway, yeah, yeah. this chapter says that very thing, that, that little piece at the end just says that very thing. It's all, he's already forgiven us. It's not something we need to continuously rag about. It's done. Yeah, excellent. And Larice. Hi everyone, Jay Baba. Um, just kind of along the lines of illusion. I also really appreciate that we have multiple lives and that Monty, Monty asked Baba and that we're gonna move forward. And to that effect, there was one point I was grieving not having any children this lifetime. And all of a sudden I went, I mean, it had been like two years off and on that I've been grieving this. And then all of a sudden I was like, wait a minute. I believe in reincarnation. I've had lots of kids in previous lives and I'm gonna have lots of kids in future lives, just not this life. And it was poof, gone. All the, any grief around <laughs> it was gone. And I was like, and then I'll know Baba or, you know, I'll be spiritual in the next life. I may be following Muhammad or somebody else, but uh, 
you know, it's all Baba, right? Thanks. Hey, good. <laughs> I want to do a song that uh, was actually written for Jean, but before that, I also mentioned to Jeff, I wanted to read something that Jean had written. Uh, we think of Darwin as having written all these wonderful words. Well, Jean was sharp as a, really, really sharp. And this is something, just a paragraph she wrote, very, very spot on, called internal obedience. When problems come up, emotional or mental, and you try to work them out, the more you try, the more you get involved and disturbed. It's when you turn the problem over to Baba and drop it, cut yourself off, and depend on Baba to direct you, that the smog of your own involvement lifts and your perception clears. Then the master's guidance flows, guidance flows through to you to show you the way. Perhaps not right away, but in time to find the solution, or else you find the problem has ceased to exist. You can't think or worry about results or solutions. When through clear perception guidance comes, you can't question it, but follow it and leave the results to Baba. In other words, obey his direction, not through logic, but by faith, accepting what you are in inwardly directed to do, or just let go entirely and let Baba work it out or not. When you turn it over to him, you can't worry about the result or outcome. Jean Shaw. Yeah. I wish I had more from her, but that's the only one. She handed these out one meeting. And uh, now this, this is completely different here. Um, many years ago, Lynn Ott came up to Dryden Farm and he, he was at a point in his life where he could barely, barely see. So they were sort of doing paintings. I guess you would call it by committee or something like that. They had sort of a group that were picking colors and things. <laughs> So we gave a talk on that. He left very early a Sunday morning and we were sitting around the breakfast table and Nancy Dryden said, you know, I dreamed a song last night or a little bit of a song. And the, the words were, Baba, put your pink coat on. I'm dancing for you. And so we started to think about pink coats and all. And then we said, well, Jean made a coat for Bob in 56, didn't she? She worked all night. All right, that was the first verse. And, but we had to change it because actually she made a white coat. But we didn't want to sing about Baba being in a white coat. So we made it a pink coat. Then we started to think of another incident in her life where just a few days before the East West gathering, she had a mild heart attack. And of course, the whole family was faced with should they go or not, or should they stay home and take care of her? So she cabled Baba, asking, telling him what had happened and asking him for advice. Well, the day comes to leave to drive to the airport and no cable from Baba. So they decided, and she felt guided, we're going to go. And they drove down. Um, Laura Delavin was with them, and her daughter was driving the station wagon. <clears throat> they arrived at uh, Kennedy Airport, Idlewild at the time, and there were the Winterfelts with a cable for Jean from Bob. And I have it here. Seven words, Bob has said. Make your heart beat. Make your heart beat to my love. And that gave her the strength to go. So we put that in the song. And uh, this is, and a group of us sat around this table, sort of, it was like a group effort. I, I credit it in my songbook to the committee. And uh, we call it Gene's song. So I'll just, I'm going to sing it a cappella. <clears throat> this is the chorus <clears throat> Oh, Baba, put your pink coat on. I'm waiting, breathtaking. Oh, Baba, put your pink coat on. Come dancing with me. Late at night, while the world was asleep, I stitched a coat for your heart to keep. Sewn from love gathered at your feet, cloth spun from the tears you made me weep. Oh, Baba, put your pink coat on, I'm waiting, breathtaking. Oh, Baba, put your pink coat on, come dancing with me. I feel your arms reaching out to me. Compassion's call across a distant sea. I pray for strength for the long journey. Guide my way safely back home to thee. Oh, Baba, put your pink coat on. I'm waiting, breathtaking. Oh, Baba, put your pink coat on. Come dancing to me. I gather courage to your gate proceed. Your loving face I now can see. My humble gift your heart receives. 
your warm embrace envelops me. Oh, Baba, put your pink coat on, I'm waiting, breathtaking. Oh, Baba, put your pink coat on, come dancing with me, come dancing with me, come dancing with me. And I have to laugh because yeah. I, the next time I went to the center, I was so proud of that song. And I decided to sing that in the meeting hall. And who should be in the meeting hall but Lynn Ott? And after I finished, I just have to, after I finished singing the song, Lynn goes, what's that Baba Pink Coat dancing? What kind of song is that? <laughs> so there, there, went, there went my pride, although it's, I still think it's a really cute song. And Rosalie, it's yeah. a great song to dance to with some instrumentation. Yeah, there's a lot of very wholesome and wonderful things that happened to Darwin and Jean. You know, they it was more homey and inclusive than you you could ever imagine. Yeah. Jeff, I'd love to get uh, their granddaughter Sherry on sometime to do some remembrance of grandpa and grandma as grandpa and grandma, you know? Yeah. Not as spiritual guides. I think that would just be a wonderful uh, and, and what about Renee? She's still alive, their daughter. Yeah. She's Maybe the two bit... of them. Maybe the two of them. She was always very shy. Yeah. Always very, I mean, very hard to get Renee to speak. <clears throat> hey, so any, so that's, this is something to think about this good and bad and right and wrong and virtue and vice and forgiveness and eternal damnation and all these things. <laughs> I was lucky, we were the heathens in the neighborhood, so I never picked up those kind of concepts, luckily. And not guilty, don't forget not guilty. Yeah, not guilty. It's, you know, it's hard to, you know, to see yourself doing things that you know are selfish and, and not let it bring you down. But if it brings you down, you're, I find I'm going to do the same thing again. I mean, I'm, I'm confirming that behavior in myself. So it's better to kind of get back on the road again and not just dwell on it too much. Um, hey, but we've got a couple of hands. We've got Mayor Prasad. I think Ruth uh, had her hand before. Oh, hey, Mayor, I can wait. Okay, um, mine might be a little bit longer, but I I remembered it when uh, Bill was reading Jean's uh, uh, that little paragraph. There is uh, something that Iruch also said along the same lines, and that's how it was. Um, I wanted to read that section. Uh, I think we read this a couple of times before, but it's very relevant to what we yeah. just read in Effort and Grace. Wait, so, one second, Mayor Versailles, just to let you know, at 10 tonight, uh, I'm going to try to interview Nashua Nalavala on the late night chat. At the same station, and uh, hopefully we can, and you know, if we can get intimate details of his experience of Baba, would be great. Okay, go ahead, Baron Prasad. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this this chapter is called "What Should We Do," and I'm reading from somewhere towards the end of the chapter. Whatever you do, this is Eruj saying. Whatever you do. Whatever you undertake, dedicate it to him. Don't even think, is it right? Is it wrong? Is it good or bad? Is it a strength or a weakness? Just dedicate everything to him. Gradually, dishonesty will fade. Gradually, other things will fade. And more and more, un unadulterated love and honesty will grow. You cannot begin with a clean slate as it were. You must begin from where you are. We all have weaknesses, but analyzing and dissecting our motives, trying to understand whether we are being prompted by selfishness or unselfishness, 
will not eliminate our weaknesses. It will only drive us crazy and make it impossible for us to do anything. The only way to get rid of our selfishness is to go ahead and do something but dedicate it to him. For example, say you decide to pick up junk from the street so that the streets will be kept clean and tidy. This is a good, a worthwhile enterprise. So you start to do it, but you notice very quickly that there is a strong desire in you to have others notice you doing this. You find yourself thinking, quote, what a good example I am setting. I am not doing this for money. I am doing it. I'm doing this for everyone's welfare and people should be grateful to me. Perhaps after a while, you even want to call attention to yourself or you get angry when others don't notice what you are doing. You may even become resentful that you are not being properly appreciated. Or then again, your ego might fasten itself upon the fact that others are not noticing you. See how spiritual I am that I am doing this even though no one is noticing or praising me for it. In short, the ego is very much present. But so what? The ego is always present. It is the nature of the ego to seize upon whatever we do and use it to strengthen itself. So what is the solution? The solution is to simply keep on doing what you are doing. After a while, that initial zeal may be gone. You may lose your enthusiasm. But if you continue, even if it is mechanical on your part, the selfish aspects of your behavior with time will fade. Eventually, you will completely forget about all those other considerations and you will find yourself picking, the, picking up the junk from habit solely from the desire to keep the street clean. It honestly won't matter to you whether others notice you doing it or not. You won't expect them to praise you. And it won't bother you if they condemn you. The action by being dedicated to him becomes purified. Beautiful. Wow. There it is right there. Ah. We got to uh, keep that always on file, Mayor Prasad. <laughs> we, we could use, use hearing that every yeah. once in a while. It lays it all out. So what, what, really, is it, what is it from again, if you could, Mayor Prasad? That's from That's How It Was. Uh, I'll post a link. It's that green book that of Eric's stories. Yeah, no, I just wanted the page yeah. numbers, but I'll get that. So Ruth, B. Yeah, a very, very serious thing I have to bring up right now. And, and Bill, I, you might know the answer, but wasn't there a song about, I want to be a button on Baba's coat? Does anybody remember that? That was Hank Midland's. Thank you. Song, I think. Yeah, that always kind of stuck. And when you were singing about the pink coat, uh, Bill, it just brought that, that back to me about wanting to be a button on Baba's coat. Is Bill that, still here? I don't know. I don't see him, but. Yeah, well, thanks. I'm just glad you remembered, Jeff. Yeah. Thank you. Whatever. Well, let's see. In a little bit, uh, Stu is here and he's uh, uh, happy to um, give us a heart-centered meditation. Well, Stu. Okay, you ready? Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Jay Baba. I guess we should all mute. So just let yourself relax into wherever you're 
sitting or laying and start breathing into your belly and we'll leave the world even a little more during this time. And just follow your breath in as you relax. And now bring your awareness to your heart and your heart center. And it's the home in you that we all have of Meher Baba's endless pool of infinite love. And just let yourself stay for another moment in your heart center and with Baba's infinite love for us. Now with your heart as your guide, pick someone who you would like to focus on sharing Baba's infinite love with. And this can be tremendously healing in the case of conflict, but you can pick someone maybe you know is struggling or somebody you already have a lot of love for would like to send them more love just whoever whoever comes up for you in your mind and heart it could be a person could be a group and as you breathe in get a good image of them in your mind and your heart See them before you, inside. And take note if you feel or see anything extra in focusing on them. And now start to picture Baba's infinite love flowing into their heart fully, their heart and their heart center. And just let his love do whatever magic it might do or not do. And you're not trying to bring about any particular change or happening. You're just picturing the flow of Baba's love filling their whole heart and heart center. And this love is infinitely giving and soothing, healing, 
uplifting, enlightening, forgiving. And keep breathing into your belly as you continue to see this infinite love flowing. And I see this delicious liquid golden light of love. filling every little corner of their heart and heart center. And now overflowing and flowing right through without end. And now gently filling every bit of their being, every little corner. There's no aspect of them not being touched by this infinite love. And we never know what wonders might happen. from the flow of this love. Let's stay here just another moment. And now let's give thanks for being able to focus on sharing Baba's infinite love. And as you bid farewell for now to whoever you've chosen, know that you can keep returning here again and again.
And now gently bring your awareness back to your own heart and heart center. And breathe in as you're aware of whatever you might feel or see as you focus in there. And now start to picture Baba's infinite love endlessly and generously flowing into your own heart and your heart center. and filling every little bit, every corner. And this love is cleansing, healing, expansive, uplifting, enlightening and forgiving. And just drink it in, let your heart drink. And now see and feel this infinite love overflowing from your heart. And flowing right through gently and just continuing to flow and now filling every bit of your being. This love is bringing its light and wonder to every bit of you. And you never know what magic might happen with it.
Let's stay here another moment. And now let's give thanks for being able to focus on this infinite love from Baba flowing into our hearts and whole being. And this love is always available. We can always return. And now gently start to bring your awareness back to wherever you're sitting or laying. And take a few moments to ease back into your surroundings. And whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes.
Well, I feel like just leaving everybody, but if anybody would like to share anything, we'd love to hear from you. Hey, Stu, that was beautiful. You know, just the thought of being able to feed on his love and send it over to whoever you think, uh, you know, who, who needs it. Uh, it's a beautiful feeling. I don't know if I could do it the way it's supposed to happen. Just the thought itself is just, just beautiful. Mm. That's the point. Thank you so much. I, I can feel that from you as you say it. Yeah. Well, I mean, at least the least I can do sitting here is to send love if Baba lets me. Mm. Yeah, very nice. Thank you, Prakash. Hey, Baba. I moved over this time to my chair where I usually do my meditation. I usually sit in a hard kitchen table and chair, and uh, it's lovely, but it was really nice tonight to just be here. Yeah, thank you. It was a good listen of all the teaching tonight out of the whole day. Oh, lost you a little bit there, Wendy. And to be able to pass it on, you know, to hold that focus and all of us who love Baba so much, it's nice to pass that on to somebody else. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Mm -hmm. mm. I'll share. I had a different one this time. I let whoever came into my head come into my head. And it was a friend. And um, as we were doing it, I was thinking, of course, of the golden, the golden ocean and uh, of light. And all of a sudden it started bubbling and just bubble, 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 bubble. And it went throughout this person and bubbled over this person's heart, went up to the face. And as it did that, the person was filled with, um, uh, was beaming, you know, mm -hmm. very happy, full of joy. And it was, it was like cleansing and then joy coming out and just a really effervescent. And then when you brought it back to, to us, you know, I um, tried to experience the same thing myself, you know, let it bubble in my heart, bubble all over me. And uh, anyway, it just left me with this great uplifting feeling. And I, I just hope that, that the friend feels that, <laughs> you know, you never know what happens, but, um, you know, it was, and I guess I, I suppose I had that that image of uh, Mr. Clean, that commercial from many years yeah. ago, Mr. Clean, Mr. Clean, you yeah. know, and how everything gets clean and it, all the bubbles are all over the place. And it's just a really happy little ditty as well. 
And it was kind of like that, but of course it has to do with love. And uh, <laughs> anyway, that was my experience this time. That, that's great. I'll, I'll bet that your friend either did or is experiencing something. <laughs> it was so interesting. It just, it just popped up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. You know, I, I was once working with a friend years ago and they were in another country. This was on the phone and we're just focusing on Baba inside. And all of a sudden, kind of like you, I don't know where it came to me. It said, I, and I had the thought, I wonder if I could focus Baba's love like kind of a golden healing tornado going through them, you know, and I was kind of guiding it and I was seeing that and picturing this wonderful little tornado of love going through. And after a while, they said to me, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and, and she said, I don't know what you're doing, but it feels incredible. Don't stop. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, now I'm prompted to call these people who I <laughs> who I had in mind when I was doing whatever you uh, told us to do, and I want to see what they feel. <laughs> you know, I, I remember Baba saying that uh, uh, we communicate at all levels of uh, our being, like mental subtle and uh, obviously gross. So anything we think just flashes across and goes to the people. Yeah. So because uh, at times we do get those uh, things, right? Oh, you just thought about me. But that's more, you know, uh, uh, but any good thought might probably help them feel better. Granted, they may not know how, why it's happening. And the same way, uh, this, the so-called things that might depress one may also travel, obviously, right? I mean, you cannot stop these things. So, uh, I mean, then, then I, I just, it, it always comes back to me, those uh, words that Zorasto said, good thoughts, good words, and good deeds. And uh, yeah, that kind of things. So. Yeah, and that, that connection is is right now prakash you know yeah yeah thank you j baba uh behind elizabeth is the the picture with the white horse and um, it, it's not from this meditation, but it reminds me of what you were saying, how people feel it and how Baba acknowledges those. And my granddaughter was having some pretty intense surgery and um, Rose and I had spent the day you know, focusing on sending her good energy and so on and so forth. And we went into the hospital room and for whatever reason, Rosa closed the door and behind the door was this beautiful white horse. Mm. And we both went, oh, that's Baba saying it's gonna be okay. She's wow. gonna be okay. Yeah. And uh, so it was, I'm just validating what we were saying, how people do feel it, you know, and you get validations and they send sincerely from the heart. Anyway, I just wanted to share that. Yeah, thank you, Wendy. Mm. And that the, the surgery went well? Yes, it did, yeah. it did. She's doing very well. She's a gymnast. Um, I would have thought. <laughs> oh, good, good. Thank you for asking. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. 
Stuart, I wanted to share something, but I'm not on screen because I'm not feeling well. Oh. And um, all the times that I've done meditations with you, it's Terry, by the way, I send the love to multiple people, one person, but I've never sent it to myself. And today I gave it to myself. And um, it felt very healing. And I wanted to share that. And thank you so much. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. You, you sent it to the right person. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Ah. Yeah, every so often somebody says, well, today I had to focus on me. And it's always the right thing. Stu, I think I've got, I believe it or not, I've got to go to work. But thank you. I mean, this is so expansive and warm. And it's like a warm ocean. So it's always something lovely. Well, always great to be with you, Jeff. And I'm, I tell you today, I'm, I'm feeling like we're still in this uh, wonderful ocean together. Yeah, it's like uh, being at a darshan somehow. Hey, we've got Nashawan Nalavala. Uh, Nashawan, we're, we're going <clears> to <throat> be seeing him uh, at least uh, whoever wants to at 10 o'clock. Same station. Yeah, so is there something else coming up now that... I don't think it's not until 10 o'clock. Yeah. Okay. No, there's RT at 9. Oh, yeah, RT at 9. That's right. But yeah, not... but you know, we had, we, we focused on Jane today, Jane Haynes, and yesterday they were talking about Dali Dastur. I mean, it's just been like a love fest recently. Yeah. I wasn't able to go to some of it, but um, mm -hmm. I think people are still kind of basking in all of that. Mm. Yeah. 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 Dolly was beautiful. It was a really beautiful. Yeah. Well, yeah. see you folks. Much, much love. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Jay Baba, Jay Baba Jeff. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you as always for yeah. your wonderful effort and grace. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> have, a, have a good dinner. Thank you for yeah. sticking with us. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Good dinner for yeah. mind and heart. Thank you, Jay Baba. Che Baba. Che Baba. Well, I'm going to go as well. Che Baba, I hope Terry feels better. And thanks for all the lovely shares from Meher Prasad and Mahu and Bill and whoever else uh, shared as well. And thank you as always, Stuart. Um, they're always very beautiful. Oh, good. Great to have you on. Okay. Che yeah. Baba, everybody. Che Baba. Bye. Thank you, Stuart. You're welcome. Amazing. <laughs> Jay Baba. Amazing. Jay Baba. Have a great week. You too. <laughs>